A father said to his son, the trouble with the mind is that once two and two equals four, it can never be otherwise. And the lad went outside, laid under an elm, chewed on his lip while wondering why some trees are evergreen and some are seasonal, and yet the brain keeps repeatedly firing at will. And just then his father called him back in. Hey, Will, come back in. Nothing is forgiven. And the boy smiled and thought, that's my old man. And God, but if it could have only been the other way around. And in answer to the many letters I've received demanding to know how amusement parks continue to get by offering the public the same old tired merry-go-rounds and roller coasters that they've already ridden a thousand times before, let me point out to you the fact that no one is aware of what you speak. And even if they were made aware of it, they still wouldn't be. So don't write me about this subject again, okay? Serious, complicated, and educated people, although they hide the fact, constantly feel like something is being put over on them. But aha! More conscious people know that there is. <laughs> when he heard the story of a man whose dentist told him that his teeth were fine, but his gums had to go, one guy was furious because he couldn't immediately see how he could use this approach vis-a-vis -vis his mind and the thoughts it entertained. Once upon a time, a man suddenly found himself in paradise. He did not know how he got there, and he did not stay long. But once back home, he concluded that a return visit would be worth almost any price. So even though he lacked specific knowledge of what took him there originally, he decided he would undertake the most difficult and unlikely effort imaginable in the hope that such might somehow be pertinent to such an unparalleled reward. And this, my friends, was the beginning of the great mystical work. The body survives through passion, and likewise seems to the mind. But in the body's case, it is imperative that it be passionate about specific things. Whereas with the mind, although it seems so, it is not. But never forget, boys and girls, in the land of the mind, seems so is all that's necessary. One man had a guy he didn't like who lived with him. And the way the guy managed to stay there was by the fact that the man very, would very seldom pay any specific attention to him. Did I make it clear that the man really didn't like the guy? I mean, really? And yet still, he paid him scant attention. And I would say, weird, huh? But by now, you know it's not. Now tonight's mental health update. According to some unverified reports, the entire concept of insanity arose from the linguistic need to identify those people who had originally undertaken the struggle to establish their own individual consciousness, but who later decided, nah, too much trouble. <laughs> to keep from having to answer the door, all you need to do is keep yakking about it. And since I know today's your birthday, I won't mention the metaphorical potential of this. A man wrote the metaphor doctor and said, Dear doctor, why don't you do us all a favor and kill yourself? <laughs> to which the doctor replied, Dear sir, such is my plan. Just as soon as you see what's going on without need for my assistance. <laughs> but thank you for your present interest anyway. One man swallowed a mirror. Then the mirror swallowed him. <laughs> then it all got confused in his mind. A man we mentioned on the last broadcast who said he was considering taking dog obedience training so that he could tell his attention to heal has an update for us. He says that he, that he had really liked to be able to do is to tell attention to sit and stay. As regards the things about which the body feels passionate. It could be said that passion equals importance. Then you'd be inclined to assume a like situation regarding those things about which the mind feels passionate, but you would be mistaken <coughs> and could realize so if you but examined it impartially, which I admit is asking a hell of a lot from a poor little mind. <laughs> what do you mean asking a lot, Professor Hargrave? Asking the impossible is more like it. Okay, whatever. The ultimate act of domestication defined. 
Civilization, man's attempt to housebreak himself. The refusal to think about what everyone else is thinking about is a first step toward creativity and originality. One man's favorite song was entitled, It Seems That I Have Heard That Song Before. Mm. Although that's not much of a hot news item since that's everyone's favorite song. Mm. And now stepping up to the plate as designated mental hitter for everybody, the indestructible Casey, who mutters to the pitcher as he cocks his bat and digs in his spikes, Okay, right down the middle, right to me. Always being sure that's a pitch I've seen a million times before. Hey, do the old noggin know how to play to the home crowd or what? One day a farmer went to one of his tenants and told him that he was going to have to let him go. But suddenly awoke and realized that his own farm was not really his to begin with. No. And thus, through his actions, unintentionally let himself go. But as we all agree, if unintentionally is the only way to get it done, then great John Deere, let it be. <laughs> a chap said to his mailman one morning, I do not understand one half of the correspondence I receive. And the postman, knowing how things tend to go in my stories, dropped his bag and ran like hell, <laughs> figuring there was every chance in the world that the upset mail recipient just might take it out on him. And I must say that I am somewhat encouraged in my efforts to at least find a few in my stories who begin to catch on to what this is all about. <laughs> Regarding collective sports, you can't get anywhere on the public playing fields unless you divide everyone into two opposing teams. Likewise, your mind and thinking. Ah, but now for some real sporting news. Fans will have no passion for the game unless it is played by two opposing teams, one of which they favor. Likewise, again, your mind and thinking, but you knew that was coming. Local conditions told one man, if you're going to work for the guides, you got to be serious, you got to spit vinegar, you got to be ready to murder, and above all, you've got to believe that you're really working for them. And the man was indignant. What do you mean, sir, got to believe that? How dare you? And off he went to do the guides' work. <laughs> Some lower joints said to the brain, geez, but we ache down here. I know, but it's because we're still growing. Mm -hmm. And now the truth about opposition. If you criticize a man, you've invigorated him. When men discover the quest, they at first feel stupid regarding how little they know. Then as they understand more about what it really is, they feel stupid regarding how little they can do. Stupid, stupid is, as stupid, stupid does. You're only stupid now if you're still what you was. One man grew increasingly tired of answering the door and finally came to realize that the only reason he did so was because he thought he cared who might be there. <laughs> Upon realizing this, he slapped himself in the face saying, silly boy. Although when asked, the mind will say that it would like to go to the land of a thousand dances. If you'll but note, it always ends up where they play nothing but the two-step over and over yeah. and over all night long. <laughs> One boy lost his toy. Well, I'm not sure lost is the proper word, but he does say that he misplaces it half of the time. Uh, isn't that sweet? Half <laughs> of the time. <laughs> Someone writes, are you sure that the attempt to bring attention under some constant control is not the same as trying to nail gravy to a wall? <laughs> no, sir, I am not sure. <laughs> Those still short of full understanding of what human existence is all about are always anxious to convince you of the validity of what they see thus far. Everyone's born in someone else's pocket. Every time the man, mind hears the term someone else, it looks in the wrong direction. <laughs> Not only do man's collective institution engage in endless, inane self-reference, but also in individual's thinking as well. As men see life sinking into a rotting, rancid state of yellowing decay, none ever check themselves for visual jaundice. <laughs> And by God, why should they? We're, not, we're put here to be ill by God, not to diagnose and treat ourselves. <sighs> and now for some once upon a time. 
Once upon a time, there was a man who could get excited only by pretending he was excited. Once upon a time. A man once wrote to the give it to me straight doctor and said, no one around where I live will give it to me straight. And the letter came back marked undeliverable, which down there jolted the man into seeing something. <laughs> One man would play with his tongue till his mind went to sleep. <laughs> this particular item is either one of two things. It is either a simple, though unusual, detailing of man's overall mental state, or else it is some kind of unexpected hint as to how to escape such. God, but don't you just hate these choices. And now an Avery update. There are no such things as homing pigeons. They're an illusion. A man told a mystic, you make me sick. And the mystic replied, you don't even know me. And the man said, and a good thing or I dislike you even more. There was once a world in which the creatures were born with tongues that, instead of saying directly what they intended to, would always say something just slightly off the mark. Yeah. And what might be of additional, uh, additional interest to you is the fact that scarce any of them ever seemed aware of this. <laughs> One man's mood he expresses as, I wouldn't want to live on any planet that would have the likes of me. And God, oh sweet astronauts, Bert, were this not also our attitude towards the relationship between our minds and what it normally thinks about? <laughs> Men continue to believe in the existence of some great enlightening secret knowledge. For the simple reason that they still refuse to see what's going on right in front of them. It's those not dead yet who make such a big deal about heaven. <laughs> the operations of the mind are like the exploits of a bank robber who is so busy and magnetic that the sheriff generally doesn't even notice him. And when he does, it's not of much use since he'll join in and assist him. A man fell prone before the great oracle and pleaded, Oh, what's the use? And the mighty one replied, The use in what? <laughs> oh, repeated the man, It's worse than I thought. And the oracle said, Worse than you thought? Well, right there's your problem, Bunky. <laughs> Beside his bed, one man hung a wanted poster as his daily reminder. It showed his mind and thoughts above this caption and warning. Frank and Jesse James, Notorious thieves and con men, but beware, are extremely charming and ingratiating. Mm -hmm. So much so that many victims find, themselves so dis find them so disarmingly familiar that they believe they know them and thus invite them freely into their homes and lives. <laughs> the only complaint he had with the warning was in it saying many victims rather than the more accurate all. <laughs> Another way to look at the collective intellectual world of man, that is civilization, is as a magnificent piece of machinery that runs off the energy of imagined passion. One man got so sick of his mind that he tried to trade it in. Problem was that the only minds he had traded for were too smart to go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you just hate how these things turn out when they turn out on you? A guy asked a mystic, what do you care about after you know the truth about life? I don't care to answer that, he answered. Yeah. There's but one way to treat the body's survival, seriously. But there's two ways to handle the minds, seriously or humorously. But don't bother asking the mind which of the two is the proper one. A man wrote the universal doctor, dear doctor, is anything ever accomplished by asking the mind anything about itself? Anger, many people's non-prescription drug of choice. If you still want to call the choices people make, choices. <laughs> Wall Street meets Linga Franca. The benefits of cliched thinking is that no one ever thinks about them. It, it can be a long way between talking about something and doing it. And to be of ordinary mind is to be able to consistently ignore this. How else do you think civilization manages to survive pookie? <laughs> or your sanity for that matter. After extensive research, one man compiled a list of all the subjects about which men claimed to have great concern, and upon looking it over, realized that he personally had not one of them. <laughs> the ultimate explanatory word regarding the annoyance of door-to-door -door salesmen. 
Your mind is the door. Thoughts are the salesman. Thus, if you think, you'll be annoyed. Mm. One man says, it doesn't bother me as much when my mind gets all caught up in the ideas of such things as sex and eating as it does when it just wanders off and I don't know where it's been. <laughs> oh, and then what may or may not be a related story, another man says that his attitude has now become anything's better than this. The head of one transcendental order of knights had this to say to them. Every time someone makes a conclusive statement regarding the great quest, a mystic somewhere suffers either a kidney stone or a yeast infection. In one solar system, a planet once asked the sun, how do you know when you've said enough? You begin to strain the bounds of your orbit, he replied. Oh, by the way, there is one more bit of mental health news. Has it struck you yet that the one thing all who are called insane share in common is that they are serious? <laughs> you cannot succeed in this pursuit unless you are prepared to chase what is either an illusionary prey or else one which can never be caught. All for a purpose which cannot be properly understood until you realize the futility of the chase. And after hearing this, if you feel like, I don't get it, then you either don't get it, or else you're still on the chase. And one knight said, well, praise be to our liege Lance, Lancelot for small things. And the attendant at the moat thought he said small change, and motioned him over to the slow lane, which thoroughly threw off his ETA. <laughs> and one knight was filled with the cry, on Randolph, on Blintzer, there where we've yet to be, calls out, calls out to me. And finally, an advanced swallowing story. After much practice, one man swallowed his tongue, then he swallowed his mind, then all was calm, and he understood. Since all people, if asked, would claim to want to know the purpose of life, the secret of life. Well, first off, uh, I should do this. Scratch that. I have been throughout the years, just, it just continues, just to be inundated with requests uh, for me to talk about my past and personal background and give details. So once in a fall, I'm just going to get that out of the way and spend the rest of the night and do that. So here it is. All men want to know the secret of life, the secret of life or the purpose of existence. But all humans except those most foolish, idiotic, and stupid know that they're idiotic, foolish, and stupid. Things are arranged conditions here such that ordinary men cannot admit this. To admit that is to defy, to defy sanity. Ordinary men cannot admit that they know that they're idiots. <laughs> this is far beyond the playground level of accusations because once the playground is populated by ordinary minds, they immediately are divided into opposing teams, and then they accuse each other of being idiots. The, you know, Italians accuse Greeks of being idiots, and Protestants accuse Catholics of being idiots. This is not the idiocy. The idiocy, that is like a, for one reason, a distraction. As long as they continue to play a meaningless game of accusation, then it, in one sense it saves them from having to face the fact that they is the idiot that humans do not know anything, that humans are absolute fools. The only way that you can be sane and civilized and be such an idiot is by staying distracted in small things so that you don't have to face the large things, such as feeling as though you are opposed by approximately half the planet 
being populated by idiots. I'm talking about immediate idiots that can, if not annoy, if do you harm, at least annoy you. And so that is part of the distraction. That is so obvious that I shouldn't even have to point that out even to idiots. I'm sorry, to our average viewer. <clears throat> there are other aspects of it that would not normally be taken into consideration in such a discussion, if such a discussion was ever taken into consideration. The kinds of things that keep men from realizing that they do not know anything. Well, they, they know what they say they know, but it's idiocy. It's just absolute foolishness. To say that they want to know the secret of life and for it to be suggested most strongly that the only secret of life there is is that which is right before your eyes. That the only secret knowledge, the only mystical information, the face of God, the source of creation, everything that men dream about is right in front of their eyes. It's almost impossible not to see it. Yet men, men, thanks to their staggering degree of idiocy, managed to pull this off. That is not completely fair. It doesn't matter, but that is not completely fair. Because it takes effort to undo the intelligence, read idiocy, that you already have, that men already have, so that they could see otherwise. Consider a few of the small things compared to what they, by any account, would be the ultimate goal of man. That the big thing is to see or to understand, to discover, to learn the meaning of life, the secret of life. Let's call that the big thing. That's about as big as the mind can conceive of. Then between here and there, the mind deals with all sorts of little small things that apparently must be dealt with before the big one can be approached, before there's any hope of approaching the big one. But you can see that the small ones are absolute idiocy. That by concerning oneself in the way in which men do with the small interim questions, things that are going on constantly at an everyday level before them, that as long as you do not see through them, as long as you do not even look at them, as long as you do not realize that they're idiocy, then the idea of some larger goal is extreme idiocy. Let me set up one other verbal premise. If realizing the secret of life would be like the ultimate liberation, it would be the <coughs> ultimate self-discovery, because you would have to discover the truth about you and man within such a discovery as to the secret or the nature, purpose of life. All along the way, this idiocy that I was speaking of, from one view as a form a manifestation of continuing self-delusion and not in the simple psychological sense that ordinary minds have it. It's even simpler than that. It is not that men unconsciously delude themselves. Men know that they're deluding themselves. If you don't know you're deluding yourself, you're not sane. Those of you that are interested in psychology, you can work that one out. Yeah, write me. Be sure and write me if you do. That'd, that'd be funny. <laughs> That'd be frightening. They'll just bar you. I was going to start pointing out some of the examples that, if you look at it just point blank, they are forms of absolute self delusion, not because I say so, but because you can see they are, and men know that they are. The fields are so rich with potential harvest, I scant knows where to first bend or reach to pick, to pluck. Someone hand me a newspaper. Someone read a word from the newspaper. Men believe, don't forget the sort of premise, that men believe, without any doubt, that the greatest thing that could be known, and that they want to know it when it brought to their attention, they want to know the purpose of life, the secret of life, the truth about human existence. They do not even want to know the truth about what's going on in their everyday life. Yeah. 
Let me just start picking from this bountiful crop. Of the many forms, I say the many forms of self-delusion, everything that goes on in the mind to varying degrees is self-delusion. That's not the intent, and it's not caused by an unconscious mind working. You don't have to look any further, it's the mind working. Because anyone who's sane knows what I'm going to point out. They know that, yeah, it's true. It is a continuing, an endless form of self-delusion that men consider to be of importance, that men, if asked about it and if they ponder it, they consider to be important steps, necessary steps along the way to a potential, to any possible discovery of the purpose of life. So here we go. Such things as... Uh, I'm going to have to go into a coma now that I think about it. There's so many good things, I don't know where to start, and it kind of put me in, it immobilized me. That's what it did. All except for saying that and making those hand gestures. It damn, it literally immobilized me, except for what I just said, for that and saying it immobilized me. So I guess I can't use that, can I? God, screwed up again. All right. An easy one to start with. How about this? All religious beliefs. The belief that seems so important to man that there is, under many guises, many religious umbrellas, that there is a life after death for sure. No sane person on this planet believes that. And they know they don't believe it. And to believe that, to not face up to the fact that that is an absolute piece of self-delusion, it is idiocy. Absolute idiocy. How can you expect to go any further? I'm not asking you personally. You cannot go any further. It is idiocy and men know it. It is only on the basis of idiocy that they so passionately defend the idea, debate it, write about it. Something not quite perhaps as obvious is all motivations of hum humans. They cannot face the reality of it. For instance, uh, they'll interview someone who just wrote a new book, and they'll ask them, well, how high after all these years and you made your living, why have you decided to write this expose of the underbelly of the music world? And the person says, well, I decided it was time that the public saw that it's not all glamour, that no matter, blah, blah, blah. Anybody knows that's idiocy. Why does no one ever just say the simple fact? Why did you write this book? Well, try to make your reputation, make some money. Why are you a minister? Well, I'd ran for office and I couldn't get elected. <laughs> I'm evidently not mean, stupid, or horny enough. Fame and fortune. No one faces the simple facts of what life is about. Uh, how about another area, since I brought politics? People continue to believe, or they'll let their people seeking office since it's now almost a worldwide phenomenon of being elected as head of the pack, that people believe you can take it either way or they will allow. They will be interviewing a candidate for some public office and say, well, why have you decided to uh, enter into this rough and tumble game of politics? And they all go, well, life has been good to me or our country's been good to me and I decided to give something back or I'm concerned about my children. And it's absolute idiocy. Everybody knows it. Why doesn't, why won't one person, why can a man say, they say, why are you offering for public office when go put yourself through all this? Uh, I like control over people. I like pushing people around. I want the power and the fame. It can't be done. Now it would, and notice this, if I was doing this under some other guys, that'd be taken as probably some you know, pretty sophomoric attempt at stand-up comedy. No based on almost that kind of childish sarcasm and poking fun at your elders, your betters. That's an easy way to dismiss it. And that is uh, one of the primary basis of humor is that kind of hostility. I'm talking about amongst ordinary people. I was not doing it to get a laugh. There's nothing really funny about it. First time you hear it, the first time or two that you realize it and laugh, I'll grant you this, I'll give you a pass for two laughs. But after that, it's not funny. It's not upsetting. It's idiocy. 
And you could correctly point out that men cannot speak in such a way. A man running for president, for the prime ministership, a person, a famous artist, a writer, whatever it is, those people who are out and apparently serving, offering to serve some real purpose out in the collective civilized activity of humanity. You could correctly point out, if you wanted to, that even if men did realize it, even if there's somebody running for public office and that they ask him over and over every day, the reporters, he hopes they ask him because he needs a publicity, that they ask him, well, why, are you, why do you want to be senator or president? And every day he tries to put perhaps a slightly different little spin on it about, well, the concern for my children and my grandchildren's future, the concern for the safety of our country and all that. And you could point out, well, even if the man understood, even if he understood that he has no interest in that, which they do not, people who want power have no interest in you, they have no interest in their children, they have no interest in the public good, they simply do not. It's not an attack on them. They have no concern about anything but themselves. That's why they are out there seeking power. That's, why, that's how you become even mentally, that is, transcendentally, above physical level. That's how people become the male alpha wolves in the packs. That's how they become prime minister. That's how they become president. That's how they become pope is they are the meanest, horniest, dumbest wolf in the pack. They have no concern about anyone else as why wolves will let them be in charge. Because who better to look after you than the most selfish, self-centered son of a bitch around, assuming he's big enough to pull it off. That's exactly. And again, anybody who is not a complete idiot can see that in the animal kingdom. That the wolves, the lions, if they ran, less well, the wolves, that you want a self-centered, wolf in charge, assuming he's big enough to pull it off. You're not going to have some wimp. You're not going to have Clark Kent if he doesn't have an actual Superman uniform somewhere. You don't want a wimp that just, a wimp that just dreams of being mean and big. He's got to be mean, horny, and absolutely uncaring about anybody else. That's who you want leading the pack, and that is who leads the pack. And if you're an idiot, if you think there is any difference between that and human affairs, the only difference is most people who run for public office shave most of the hair off their face and they wear a suit and tie and their tail doesn't stick out. <laughs> but it's the same thing. And let's assume that you're an ordinary person and you were saying, well, ordinary people, well, under ordinary conditions, we could not do that, even if men understood it. Yeah, but how come that even a man cannot face it himself? Why cannot a man who... How is it that the public, let me put it another way, the people in such a position, as the example I was using, such as seeking to be head of the pack, seeking to be in charge of running political or religious affairs. Anybody that wants to be in charge, it's all the same thing. Yeah. I guess we should note that to make sure that we don't have, again, absolute idiots. There's no difference between being pope of any religion. There's no difference in that and a senator. No difference. No difference between that and the chief of police of your hometown. Anybody who is in charge, anybody who wants to be in charge of any group of people, they don't want to be in charge whether it appears to be spiritual, physical, economically, or economic, or anything. If they want to be in charge, they have no interest in the people they're going to be in charge of. None. And you've got to be an idiot not to realize that. I was going to say... That ordinary men, uh, you could ask, well, why can't someone seeking office? And they say, well, why is it that you would like to be president? And I say, why is it that someone can't say, well, I'd just like to run things. I want to be in charge. I want to be the head wolf. That's what I want. Next question. You got another question after that? And you say, an ordinary person will say, well, they couldn't do that because things would fall apart. Even if that were true regarding his overt response, Notice this. People do not think about this. Ordinary people, educated, sophisticated people, let's use politics for a minute, those who keep up, those who study the issues, who follow the candidates, and whatever the field is, those people never have such a thought. And yet they know it's true. Unless they're absolute idiots. And about the only, about the only exception when I said that all but the most idiotic of humans know that humanities that humans are idiots 
Uh, the main exception I had in mind, by the way, was the alpha male wolves. Because their attitude, they don't know that they're idiots. They think that everybody else is idiots. There is, as always, a kind of balance. So if you look at it one way, when I say that all humans, that humans know, except the most, the most foolish of humans, know that all humans are fools. When I said almost, the exceptions are like on each end. And the one, one I just said are those that are driven to want power. They are the complete idiots. They know that their attitude is, they don't understand. When I Remember what I said was that all but the most idiotic of humans know that humans are idiots, know that they're idiots. Those at the far end of seeking power, the alpha male wolves type, their attitude is everybody in the world is an idiot but me. <laughs> and so they're an exception because they do not include themselves. The other end would be the tail end, whatever they call them in zoology, of a wolf pack, to continue that. The absolute runt the one who is afraid of its own shadow, the one who would, that everybody picks on, just the tail end of the parade. But other than that, everybody else in the middle of the pack, except those two extremes, they know what's going on. But notice this, I say they know it, and I'm telling you they do. I'm, tonight's not a night for debate. Humans know that people running for president, sane people, if they were sitting there at a public debate or some speech of somebody, a big high-class candidate, probably the, the victor, wherever it is, and you stood there next to him, and the guy was talking about all the reasons that he wants to be president, that he will take on this onerous burden because of his great compassion for the poor, the downtrodden, and his great concern for future generations of our great country. And you're standing next to a sophisticated, educated, sane, everyday man, and you go, you ever think that's bullshit? He doesn't give one goddamn about anybody in the world but him. That's the kind of people that run for office. You ever think about that? The person knows that what you just said was true. I'm not going to debate it. I'm not going to argue it. And it's not psychological. And they would not admit it. They could not admit it. But they know damn well it's true. They would not be there. They will not vote for him. They know that's true. If he meets the qualification that I said, which is not mine, by, by society's qualifications... If he is a sane, ordinary person, he knows if a saint so showed up, if Albert Schweitzer or Mother Teresa showed up in some garb and actually meant that I want to be president because of my great concern for my fellow man, uh, the socialist candidate, the Labor Party candidate, the rock and roll candidate, Mickey Mouse will get more votes than that person. No one sane. No one sane and ordinary would vote for a saint. That is, for somebody who actually meant it, which would be, the, whoever they are, would be outside the mainstream. The people standing there know that what I just said is true. That that man, you know, if you did it as a non-accusation, in a non-accusatory term, you just say, isn't that strange? You ever think, I'm sure you have, but you ever think about you know, all this talk about their concern for us and our welfare? The kind of people, not just him, but the kind of people who always want power, they don't care a goddamn about anybody. That's why they want power. They don't care. All they care about is themselves. I don't mean that the person would agree. But as soon as you said it, they know it's true. They knew it true before you said it, but they've got no occasion to ever say it. And so my question thus far along the line is, what's going on that people know that? People know that, and no one talks about it. So you, you can't weasel out just by saying, as I had a fictitious observer say a few minutes ago, that, well, even if people do know that, they can't say it because it would wreck civilization, which is true. But that still does not answer the question. That if they know it, why don't they ever think about it in private? Why don't they ever talk about it? No one thinks it unless it's pointed out to them. No one thinks in any, anything object, uh, uh, resembling an objective manner that what I said about the belief in life after death is idiocy. It's foolish. And nobody believes it. And the closest that they come to it is people realizing that they don't believe it, and therefore they came up with the concept of faith to counteract it. <laughs> they run out. That's like you show up on the playing field, which the mind does this all the time, but this is just perhaps an easy example. The mind shows up on a playing field. You're out there in the middle of this stadium, that is, read your brain, and now you are suddenly conscious. Read, you can think, and there's thoughts running back and forth. Now you're on the playing field, and it's like you're naked. 
no pads, no cleats, no helmet, and you realize you're faced with an unbeatable foe, death, or according to the way you look at it, life. <laughs> and to compensate for it, what the mind does immediately is it conjures up and has run on the field almost immediately the, the appearance of an opposing team. And the opposing team is always, and then you've got your choice of adjectives, is always weaker, more nude, less equipped, dumber, meaner, more dangerous than they are. And as long as you can turn your attention over there, which is an absolute misnomer of a statement to say you turn your attention, but I know that's the way it appears, but as long as your attention is held over there, you don't have to think about it. You do not have the time to think about, you will not think about what is going on with you. So therefore people say, aha, there's always heathens in the world saying that we should not believe in life after death. There they are. There they are. And sure enough, there they are. It doesn't matter whether they're there or not. As soon as you say they are, they are. You go, where, where? And you go, well, they left, but you know, I heard them talking about it. They said there is no life after death. And now you feel better. You understand? As long as you've got heathens... You don't have to face up with what you would think anyway. Hmm. Try it another way. I didn't think I'd have to stoop this low. <laughs> if you're an ordinary person, you're an ordinary person, and, you're trying, and you really insist that you believe in life after death. I mean, the idea of you dying just scares the sh piss out of you. And so you insist, you go to church all you can, you read a Bible or something, or a book that keeps saying, there's life after death, there's life after death. And they keep quoting different people and different pictures of how it might be. So you keep doing that. And then someone comes along and says, do you realize that the, probably the most foolish thing people ever say is that they believe in life after death because you and I both <laughs> know it's an idiocy. You don't believe that. I don't, nobody believes that. The mind is then prepared. That, Wait a minute. I already heard about that. There will be opposition. There will be heathens, that is, people who do not believe what I believe. And it's already warned us in the book. My minister, my rabbi, somebody told me, beware. There will be those come out on the field that will accuse, that will deny your good beliefs. They'll have to stoop lower. <laughs> See, as long, as long as there seems to be a ready-made, as long as your mind is already prepared, that, ah, there will be those. <laughs> Maybe I didn't do the whole... Very, my holy book, my Vedi Mecum, my mother's great wisdom. And I quote now, it says, Verily, verily, <laughs> be prepared that there shall be those who might approach thee and deny the faith that thy God and religion has given thee regarding life after death. And they quote it, they think about it, and they look at you. That is, they look at the truth. That is, you know it's idiocy. You don't believe it. Aha! And so they don't think, well, it's not me that doesn't believe it. It's them who don't believe it. <laughs> That's why it is ridiculous to talk to ordinary people. Because the closer you get to tell them the truth, even if you in some way can trick them momentarily, or, you know, drug up their coffee and put them in some kind of state to where they can hear just reality, not my reality, but hear things described more as they are, which they know already. But now, if I had this particular drug and slipped it to them to where their resistance was lowered, and they could hear it, when they'd come out of it, they would still deny they hear it, that they heard it. Because what the mind already does is that which it doesn't want to hear, which is simply, there's only one thing the mind doesn't want to hear, and that is the truth. Not my truth, but what the mind doesn't want to hear is what it already knows is true, that it doesn't want to hear. Well, that guy running for president, your, your priest, your rabbi, if, if they would swap him a seat, if they would make him mayor of the city, he'd leave this temple like that. My rabbi? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, he would, he'd forget your name. He would know you if he saw you again. But this man that is concerned about our future, the welfare of our children, who would be our mighty prime minister, <coughs> if in some way he could rally the forces here, the armed forces, and get around the damn French constitution... This idea about great elections and he, the freedom of democracy and he wants you out there voting, shh, you people be done for. He'd have you at gun barrels, at the end of gun barrels, and he'd be in charge. He'd save all this stuff of him having to go out there and say, please vote for me. <laughs> That's what people do not want to hear. The mind cannot hear it. And so it is already prepared that if you try to point it out, it takes it as criticism and it sees you as 
a heathen. That in not lore. I'll go back to the one and we'll leave it. You either. Ordinary people. I'm telling you point blank. Ordinary, sane, everyday people. Sane, religious, ordinary people. They know that it is idiocy, the idea of life after death. They know it is just foolishness. They know it. They do not talk about it. And it is already, the mind is already wired up. They have what appears to be external sources. But it's already been fed information to make up for this fact. That if it's suddenly pointed out that somebody goes, uh, I'm not sure there is life after that. That sounds like just a, some kind of dream. That sounds like some a child would make up. They already are prepared. They know it's true, but rather than them have to face the fact, well, damn, I knew it was true, but you didn't have to bring it up. They're, no, 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 no. They already are prepared like, huh. And they think back, don't make me record again from their great holy works of verily, verily. There will be those sinister figures who shall approach thee from foreign lands. You know, heathens. In other words, somebody will point out the truth. They can dismiss the fact that, hey, I didn't think there is no life after it. I didn't think it's foolishness. They said it. And they're obviously not one of us, and so they can dismiss it. And, of course, you get good. You can forget all this about heathens and me talking to somebody and making gestures. You're mine. That's why you've got two sides to the brain. Those of you who do, <laughs> it bounces back and forth. There is one reason and one reason only that men appear to have passion. And I tried to tonight, if you didn't notice, while giving a detailed bio of myself up until now. We're up to now about 1989 and 1990. That I have attempted to put into it some passion, which was all feigned. But the reason that men appear to have intellectual passion in politics, in religion, uh, on lesser scales and the educational structure, but anybody who is standing up and apparently delivering information, who is trying to convey some view, who is, who is speaking to a crowd, and normally, if it is anything other than a one-time, a one-off affair, that they just con somebody into making a one-time speech, if somebody is in charge, if they're alive, and I'm not discounting entertainers. That's just a fairly innocuous level compared to, in one sense, from politicians and religious leaders. But anybody who has a rule that their life is tied up to doing this thing up here in front of a stage and people sit, it is in one form playing alpha male wolf is what they're attempting to do. I mean, it's no secret. Again, everybody knows this, and the crowd is playing the pack. And very often, at least anybody takes this as being a criticism, notice this. The pack people pay for the damn privilege. <laughs> so don't be whining to me and go, that's kind of harsh. I mean, what's harsh about it? Don't show up. Yep. Now, if you think it's harsh and you think I'm attacking nice religious leaders and some political leaders who, for darn sure, I mean, some look so nice and they, they speak so sweetly and you can hear a kind of conviction, a kind of breaking in their voice at times. <laughs> That, you know, they can't all be that bad. All right, if they're not, or if they are, you, it's an easy way out. Under most conditions on this planet now, it's more and more that way, is, is exemplified by representative democracies, as they call them. More and more, is this, or less and less, is this planet run by physical dictatorships, which manifests itself all the way down the line from political to religious and otherwise. So in most areas of the planet now, anybody be hearing me speak in person or in tape, would be living under conditions wherein your leadership from in all areas of your life is by some degree an elected, that apparently the group, whether directly or indirectly, that like they, they elect their public, their political officials, and then their political officials may all get together in certain groups and appoint the heads of universities. And etc. And so indirectly the point is people do not seize power. Popes do not now raise up a small army, anti-popes or opposing popes, and try and take over the Vatican anymore. And people do not get together and try to take over the Norwegian parliament. 
Any time that you have that situation, which is now becoming the norm, remember this. At least you take any of this or try to weasel out by going, well, you sure are hard on it. And I guess some people are like that. You know, that would be politicians or priests. And some people are kind of self-centered. If you take it as a criticism, look at it this way. If you try to weasel out that way, look at it this way. Under the conditions nowadays, it takes an audience to play. People have to go vote. It takes the rest of the pack for them to be in charge because now wolves do not take physical control. They have to kind of whine around and go around most of the pack and go, of course, indirectly, like through body language, or if you want the real way, through the unspoken awareness that everybody has that what I'm talking about is true. But it's through the awareness they have to go around to the other members of the, the pack and go, look, I'd like to be in, in control. I'd like to be head wolf. Maybe there's another one goes around and says, no, nah, I would. The other wolves, they recognize which one is the meanest, the horniest, the most self-centered, the least caring about wolf affairs. They recognize it, and they'll vote for him. It is the same way in human affairs. But notice this. It takes somebody to go along with it. That nowadays a wolf cannot jump up. A man cannot jump up in the middle of France and go, by God, Napoleon had it correctly. I'm going to take over. <laughs> he ain't got a dog's chance. It will not happen. That's not the way life is right now. So it's not going to happen. He has got to go around and, and try. Whether he thinks about it or not, he is trying to give the unspoken message that, do I look familiar? Huh? <laughs> Aren't you tired of all? Aren't you tired of all the disruptions in the street? Aren't you tired of? Aren't you tired of crime? Wouldn't you like for things to be more settled, huh? <laughs> now beyond all that, men are absolute idiots. Every day, sane people, the people that are the heart of humanity, the majority of the world, they're idiots, fools. They're stupid, and they know it. They know it. Now take all that as any good would-be non-stupid ignorant person <laughs> would do and see that in the operations of the human mind, your mind, your mind, the same situation goes on continually. Your mind has no more Direct knowledge, it cannot admit any more than people do. It cannot admit that it is attracted, that there is an attraction in their thought processes of thoughts. It's a good thing we're at the end, isn't it? <laughs> that thoughts that to them, that to their mind, appears to be the alpha male wolves. It is the hardest. Now, they would put it another way. If anybody could even follow this, an ordinary person, they would, they would be more likely if I would say, all right, you're attracted to the thoughts that seem the most logical. And they go, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Which is, that's far beyond bullshit. I don't know what's worse than bullshit. That is absolute idiocy. But that, I could get them to go with that. Well, yeah. Your mind is attracted to thoughts that seem to be logical. Yeah. Reasonable. Yeah. To make some sense. Yeah. And if you say, all right, let's, how about this? You're attracted to the thoughts that seem to be pleasurable. Well, not always. So now we're getting closer. Then I say, you're attracted to the thoughts that seem to overwhelm you. You're attracted to the thoughts that seem to be smarter than you are. What you're attracted to are the horniest, dumbest, meanest, roughest thoughts that ever passed through your mind. Then they go, What? <laughs> what? And they know it's true. Well, they would never know it's true that way. They know this. Back where we start. They know that they're damn idiots. They know that they do not know what's going on in their minds. And the only difference, the only possible difference between them and us is that some people get involved with this, they suspect it. Or better yet, when it's pointed out to them, they think, yeah, what did I think of that? When you point out that you're an idiot. Don't let it get around, and it can't be proven, and it is not comparable. There is no way to judge it. You're simply an idiot, not relatively, not compared to somebody else. You're a fool. You're an idiot. You're stupid. And you go, well, damn. And it took this long for somebody to 
I should have seen that. Well, thanks a lot. That's the difference. And now I'm sure all the people in TV land, now, now that you see the error of your ways, go ahead and send in your applications for membership now. <laughs> Cut the tape. Whatever you do, don't put our address on the screen either.